I don't think there's any lack of places to go creatively that wouldn't be worth exploring in the interest of humanity being better. We should never forget this is about making emotional work so that you can still create beauty in this world. You know, we're not designers of shapes, we're designers of ideas. What architects and designers do is not go along with rules, but make people see things in a totally different way. Try to create brave and generous people. Allow yourself to be aware of what's wonderful. And then uplifting, maybe, ultimately. What's the brief? <laughs> you have to respond to something that makes you gasp with delight. And you know it right away, you go, da, 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 da. whoa, that's it. Briefs are not handcuffs or railroad tracks or whatever overused analogies we can use. I think they're thought starters. For me, it is, it is not a printed piece of paper. If we were to get a brief, um, the shorter the better. It has changed, the role of the creative brief. I don't think it's ever been as important as it is now. Simplicity is everything. The more concise and the sharper the point of view is as to what is the problem, the better the work will be. say what's a creative brief, I think it's a, it's a short form communication tool from a client or you develop with a client to sort of set out the mission. It's a clarity of purpose. A brief is nothing more than an open statement of ambition for a brand or a client. That's all it is. And that can be put in any words you care so long as it communicates the passion and conviction of your aim. The most important thing about the creative brief would be that it has to inspire the people who are given the task of solving the problem. It's a great starting point. And after that, the brief keeps changing, you know, through the conversations, let it change. The brief has to leave a lot of room. You have to be given a lot of runway, a lot of runway so you can take off. The fact that the word is called brief is interesting because briefs can often be very long. A big fat document that is the history of the company. We've gotten some that have made no sense. Maybe it's a bad brief, it has too many pieces. They're overly detailed. Least brief of all briefs. We've gotten some that have been a little uh, restrictive. you got to be kidding, I can't guarantee you I'm going to do that. We have this phrase uh, amongst our, all of us in the, in the business, your briefs are showing. And the brief was either too prescriptive or the project was the wrong project for the person responding. <clears throat> So right off the bat, I have to start with the, um, the notion, without being too flipped, that I don't believe in briefs. I believe in relationships. Well, the difference between a brief and a relationship is a brief can be anonymous. And I've tended over in the last you know, 15, 20 years to really work with people who give you like, um, like, a, like a really deep sense of where it is that they want to go, what it is that they're dreaming about. Um, and that in turn has informed us on the projects probably more than any brief has ever done so. The discussions we have early on um, have to be inspiring, have to be about vision, have to be not just about the next product, but about you know, the goals and the aspirations of the whole enterprise. You know, originally my relationship with Hossein Rahman, the CEO of Jawbone and, and Jawbone in general, started with uh, a technology that suppressed noise, took away the ambient noise, but the company had no product. It, it just had a technology, it had, it had algorithms. And um, so the brief really evolved out of discussions, out of the relationships I built um, with Hossein and Alex, um, the co-founders, um, and really sort of was built around this notion of everyday life. It wasn't sort of a, a work tool as much as it was something that kind of liberated your hands to do other things with them while you were in conversation. 
And we really wanted it to be about lifestyle, about how I live, not about you know, how I'm going to take a technology into my life, but rather simply how the technology is going to enable certain things in my life that are important. Whether it's the Jambox, whether it's the Up, we've um, kind of pioneered them. And how do you pioneer something with a brief? A brief is supposed to describe um, a lot of the outcomes and a lot of the intent. So if the brief was very short and it said, we want to change people's lives through sound and music and have sound and music really adapt to their everyday, that would be a great brief. It's short. I don't think that having a brief as an artifact has ever been the point. And, you know, even creating a brief is a creative conversation. And engaging a client in that kind of a conversation is fun. The relationship with the client is, can be pretty exciting, especially if you're working on a concert hall. You know, it's dynamic. And now we're working along with Dudamel in Venezuela. All of these things change the texture, the color, the thinking, the, the ideas, how it's going to be used, and they affect what it's going to look like. You know, there are many different ways to have a dialogue, and the, and the best one is that you understand that somebody trusts you. And then if you trust each other, you can say, well, I don't think that's a good idea, or that might be a better thing to do. Well, I mean, in really practical terms, we say no to clients that come to us wanting a campaign. You know. Uh, we say yes to the ones that are really great, have exciting uh, problems and opportunities, and want a long-term relationship. When the job of being an ad agency was more about making ads. The role of the creative brief was simply to tell you what media you were gonna fill and what kind of message you were gonna put in it. We're finally being charged with creating results, not just ads. The best briefs I've ever worked on have always been the most audacious and seemingly impossible, including the Samsung one. And their brief was simply stated, we want to be a credible number two to the smartphone leader. They came with a marketing problem. It wasn't like, hey, we really want to do a campaign to launch this new phone. Um, the marketing problem that, as it was given to us, is we have the best innovation in the marketplace, which was true. Nobody knows about it, which is also true. And the only way to kind of kind of push against their main competition was to be aggressive about messaging that they had taken the innovation advantage. Like, how do you get that message out there? And assuming that the first two things were, were true, which you got a pressure test, but it just so happened that they were. I mean, the GS2, which is the first phone that we launched, was the, the best smartphone on the, on the market, because finally Android had gotten up to speed. You know, they had the the right number of apps, the functionality, the form factor, everything was better, bigger screen, brighter screen. So it's just like, okay, that's a great marketing problem. You have a better product and no one knows it. If it comes to us that clean, which is really rare, um, it's a very exciting creative brief. But who knew, you know, in a year, and at least in public and brand terms, they were number one, and now they're number one in sales. Audacious briefs, baby. Make shit happen. <laughs> if you're saying this is the goal, you can measure success by a number of metrics. But we try and encourage it also to be a statement of, um, you know, maybe what the dream is. Like a, like a really deep sense of where it is that they want to go, what it is that they're dreaming about. I've put the duality in the brief, which is a deadline and then and a dream. I've got a really nice situation that I can have a fluid brain and go from an assignment, which if it intrigues me and I think it's gonna be wonderful to do, hurrah, 
and then, um, or I come up with stuff, and that's more mulling and wandering around and, uh, and letting the process of just being alive inform what I'm gonna do. There's a kind of an opening of possibilities when you're working for children, and you really have to ask yourself what's important, because you usually get only 32 pages to do a children's book. And so you better, you better really know what you, what you need to say in 32 pages, which is not that much. The second book that I did, I wrote and I painted. It was called Hey Willie, See the Pyramids. And those were very short stories about my family and friends. And I found the essential me. I was able to go off on tangents and tell these strange stories and do the paintings and create the entire world and design the copyright page so it didn't look like a copyright page. The nice thing about it, the brief in my world is that it's both extremely pragmatic and concrete. There is a product, you will make a book or an illustration for a magazine. And then the brief is fantastically elusive and completely romantic, which is what, it, what of yourself are you going to put into this work that will make it something that anybody wants to look at? You gotta trust yourself. You gotta look at your signature and realize, for better or for worse, that's you. And that you bring a persona to the table. Use the projects you're given as a way to start to define how you think, how you differentiate yourself, what it is you're gonna to bring to each project. There's a kind of, I think, more typical idea of what the brief is, which is a communication that, at its best, is a kind of provocation. For instance, uh, the Cosmopolitan, which was a project in Las Vegas we were brought on board. Actually, the slabs were up, and the developer went bankrupt, a new developer took over, and we were brought in, and our brief was help us create a resort that will be substantially more urban than anything that exists in Las Vegas, will be uh, more contemporary, and might in fact relate to the way the world changes so quickly in a way Las Vegas doesn't. Now that was, I think, a very interesting brief for us because um, it acknowledged that, and in, in, in we agreed that the idea of Las Vegas is much better than the reality. You know, it sort of has this reputation, the place it's reinventing itself, but there are these very big fixed one-liner monuments there that you either like or you don't like, but there's no, nothing that happens beyond that. So we had the provocation, which is, let's create a place that is a little bit more changeable. And then we had the fixed condition of a relentless series of floor slabs that were already up. And then part of the brief acknowledged their big challenge. And their big challenge in their mind was how vertical it was. So it was, I think, 3,000 rooms on, on six acres, quite small. So the fact that it was that vertical in their minds was a limitation because they had to stack public spaces and restaurants were on the third floor and it, was, it differed from... So that tension between what they wanted and what they had built is what um, allowed us to come back with two big suggestions. One was to blow a hole through the podium, take about 40,000 square feet out, and create an opening through the three bottom floors so that you would experience it vertically. So that the floor slabs and the verticality weren't the challenge, they became the asset, as they were different from anything else. And the other, uh, challenge was um, you entered through a sea of columns, it's huge, I think six foot by six foot, 14 foot tall concrete columns, eight of them in a lobby, and they were there. But it allowed us to think about work we had been doing in our technology lab, how can we use technology in our projects to bring people together, not to have technology as layers that separate people. So we started to talk with the lab and realized we could take the surfaces of these columns 
and treat those as a canvas and then create an open source platform so that lobby would always be changing. Those ideas would not have come about without a brief that had limitations and an invitation. We're always looking for new connections and ultimately what we do at the end of the day is make connections nobody else has seen. We don't create anything out of thin air and that magic dust is like what's happening in culture right now. I do a tremendous amount of cultural research. See, see all those gray files on the other side of my office over there? Those are all my files on research. Incredibly important, that idea of context uh, is more important today than ever before. Because we have this habit today of thinking that information is knowledge. It's not. Just because you can Google it doesn't mean you have context for anything. You've got to explore all these, uh, these ideas or you're irresponsible. Question how things are made, why they're made that way, and materials that haven't been used. I'm constantly exploring the periphery like that and with things that interest me. And the exploration is what leads to uh, the, what looks different. through now with the Eisenhower thing. It's just painful. It's a endless Yom Kippur. <laughs> the original gesture was we had a four and a half acre piece of land in the middle of DC surrounded by three fairly nondescript big buildings that housed departments that Eisenhower started, Voice of America, Education, and FAA. So how do you corral a site like that to put a memorial in it? Somebody made a proposal that it's like a Greek temple or something. You can do it that way, but that wasn't Eisenhower. You know, we've done everything on it in Eisenhower's words. So we've gone to great lengths to understand him or who he was and his life and what he stood for. And it's really careful. I can dot every I uh, and cross every T on every subject about it and prove that we followed that. Now, you may not like it, the conclusions, but, uh, and not everybody's gonna like the same thing, but um, in terms of being responsible to what a memorial for this gentleman, would be, we have been. He was the boy from Abilene. He talked about it. Abilene is the geographic center of America. So we came up with these tapestries in metal that are transparent that show Abilene. So that sets the context, and in the middle of it, we show Eisenhower as the general and as the president. That's in the brief. That's a written brief that we had to do that. The idea of the boy looking at his future came from a meeting with the family was there. And it's in front of the Department of Education where there are events with school children on a regular basis right there. To have a young boy, same size as them, sitting on a thing looking at There's something about it that resonates with everybody. Now the, the self-righteous classes who are fighting us are saying you're portraying him as a hick, and he wasn't that. And I'm saying you're calling all the people in the Midwest hicks. It's un-American. <laughs> when you're an architecture student, the brief is God. But I've learned about the brief, whether it's verbal or written. It's our job to challenge it. The brief is probably it's irrelevant from the moment that you've read it, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, things are already different. We'll literally rewrite a brief like six times in the course of making stuff. I think what makes a great project 
is a brief and a response that resonate but don't agree. Like, oh, well, you know, all the chairs in the mid-range that are doing well in Europe have, you know, foam backs to them. And this is exactly when I go, okay, that means we should not have a foam back, right? And, and what they actually meant is, yes, it should have a foam back. Well, you know, look, look where we end, ended up, right? One of the responsibilities of creative people here is to reject the brief if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel inspiring. You just can't sit there passively and just take it and, and not put thought into it. So if the brief isn't true, then it, stop working on it. Stop. Well, the brief sparks something. Probably, you know, the one that we'll always talk about the most is the, the 1996 Olympics for Nike. And we'd, we'd been stumbling for a while and trying to come up with the work and come up with the brief and so forth. But then finally, sport is war minus the killing. So that was the brief and that set the tone. Now that was backed up by a summer long of interviews that we've done with the athletes where we knew, not just intuitively or instinctively, but we knew for a fact how they felt in their hearts about competition. And the brief is what gave us the kind of the guideposts in terms of uh, the, the mood and, and, and the kind of work that we created. When you say sport is war, minus the killing, there's a certain tone in there. And if you look at the 96 work for Olympics, it was pretty controversial. Uh, it wasn't just marketing speak and it wasn't just creative for the sake of being cool or being creative, it spoke from the heart of the athlete. And so the tone was very aggressive. And that brief helped to set that, set that tone. I think your creative energy always has to come at a problem with the objective of creating the truest thing. You always have to be protected by truth. You're naked. Without the truth, there is no, there's nothing left. Let's cut the marketing bullshit and just get to the truth. And then we can go from there. Nine times out of 10, you're in the middle of that conversation and you'll get to a moment of passion or frustration and they'll just be like, why can't we just bleh? And there it is. And then you go, that, that's all you gotta do. What, we should just do that. I'm trying to find a certain elemental truth in work and in living. And then something comes out of it that, that hopefully is essential, is an essential feeling. Hopefully what starts to emerge is something that grows out of the brief, but not directly, linearly from it. And that's what's the DNA of the project? What's the engine that's gonna drive that project forward emotionally? And it's good to get information. I like the more information, the better. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I want to start projects in total ignorance. On the contrary, but what I what I what I want is much more of the soft side. I want to understand how it is that people are living with these products. I want to understand how it is that these products, you know, change their lives a little bit. The visual cues that we put in a product, of course, are important, but they're all at the service of an idea. The one thing that a brief really needs to articulate to me is why are we doing this? Why are we doing anything at all? Why are we going to go into market? Why are we going to spend $50 million? You know, I feel like that's, a, it's again, it's one of those higher order questions that really help me get creatively engaged. You know, when you start telling me what and how through, in the form of a brief, I'm like, you're taking creative tools off the table, man. Give them back. You know, you don't have to like what we come up with, but just at least give us the choice of, you know, whether we want to use a paintbrush or a jackhammer. And uh, if you tell us why we're going to do this thing, it, then we got to use everything. The creativity thing is trusting your intuition and being curious. I grew up with that because my grandfather read me from the Talmud, and the Talmud is, is all about why. It starts with why and it just keeps whying the hell out of you all for endlessly. That's creativity. 
inspiration comes in different forms, you know. If it's the right question, um, it'll be enough. <laughs>